couple of people that I want to introduce. Some of the panelists were um, earlier speakers, so you, you know who they are. But um, we have some additional people on the panel, and I'm going to be very brief. Um, and if you could just indicate who you are when I when I call out your name. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Scott McPherson, um, who is the IT business leader of Enterprise Architecture at Progressive Insurance, and uh, he is. Um, been with, uh, he, he has been with Progressive for seven years and has worked in the IT industry for, years. So, sorry? 24 years. 24 years. <laughs> sorry. That's right. Um, and, <laughs> and, and he has been in the IT industry for, for, for 30 years. He's a graduate of uh, Ohio State University. Um, Leo Schuster is director of IT architecture at Nationwide Insurance. Um, and he's a seasoned IT professional who has uh, worked with our organization before, so glad to have Leo back here. Um, and prior to, prior to um, going to a, a Nationwide, um, he had uh, uh, been with uh, the Enterprise Architecture Group at, at National City um, and Ohio Savings Bank, and he's also been with Progressive Insurance at some time. Uh, he's over 15 years of IT experience, um, he holds a master's in computer science and engineering from Case Western Reserve University and an MBA from um, Cleveland State University. Then we have uh, Dr. Sasi Pele, um, who is currently um, on detail to the office of the director of the NASA Glenn Research Center. Um, and prior to that, um, he served as the uh, chief information officer of NASA Glenn for 14 years. Um, he's been a recipient of lots of awards, I read here. <laughs> um, he, holds a, uh, he holds master's and PhD degrees in computer science from Case Western Reserve University, and also a master's degree in management of technology from uh, the Sloan School of Management at MIT. So, welcome. Um, and for the, the panel discussion, uh, we thought we would start off with all the speakers um, speaking very briefly about um, opportunities and challenges to leverage enterprise architecture. So we'll start with Jeannie. And before I start, um, Dr. Ross has to leave here at, in, in about 15 minutes. So uh, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll get her started here quick. Uh, first, let me apologize. I didn't realize how close I was uh, running my flight this evening. Um, and mostly I want to hear what other people have to say about the opportunities and challenges because I think you've heard my spiel. But I, I will comment on one thing that Ed said and, and what I think it means in terms of opportunities. Uh, I, I would have to say that the two questions people ask me the most are, A, I'm an enterprise ar architect. How do I demonstrate my value to the organization? And B, where do you get enterprise architects? So let me give two quick answers to that. First, if you have to ask the question, how do I demonstrate my value, you should shift jobs. It means you are in an organization where they have boxed you into a corner and you aren't. If you have to ask that question, you probably aren't delivering value. Uh, because the, the whole trick here is for every initiative, you know what the value is going to be, you know who's going to take responsibility for it, and you know how, how you're going to measure it. So if that's not happening, Enterprise architecture hasn't come of age in your organization, and it's, it's going to get a bad name real fast. So I would not look to try to measure or approve the value. I would look for a role where you can have a bigger impact, and then you can hopefully revive architecture kind of uh, covertly, because if you start delivering value towards a platform, you will get to where the, someday you can say, oh, by the way, we've adopted enterprise architecture. Uh. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, I think I better stop there. <laughs> oh, where do you get enterprise architects? Uh, uh, you mentioned this. You, you, you raise them. You develop them. You train them. I, uh, the CIO at um, Conway said to me, uh, we wanted great architects, and we couldn't find them in the market. So basically, we waited till some developers came to us and said, 
you know, I was trying to figure out this system, and I realized it all depends on that system and that system and that system, and now so-and-so is going to do that. And then we say, oh, you're an architect. And then we just put them into a different group, and, uh, and we give them lots of training. And I, I do think there is a mentality that uh, belongs to architects, and, and we can identify it, and then we can coach it and mentor it in, into greatness. So um, I think those are some of the opportunities and challenges awaiting us. I, uh, I mentioned a number of them at the end of my, my presentation, but I think just to reiterate that the, the opportunity of, of really that linkage between business and, and IT and the applications and looking at it uh, from the top down instead of always from the bottom up is, is really a great opportunity. And to really decompose the business into those capabilities and, and differentiate those things that are core versus non-core. And incremental success will come with that. Uh, because, uh, like I said, it's a journey, not a mission. And uh, so I would really, f I think that's where a great opportunity exists. I think there's uh, openness now in thinking creatively, uh, given that a lot of the, the recession has passed us um, and, and organizations are able to start thinking a little bit more um, strategically as opposed to tactically. So I think that's where a great opportunity exists. Uh, first of all, I want to dispel any Oh, rumors about the federal government. NASA is exempt from George's presentation, so. <laughs> uh, but I think you said it right. I, th I think the, the way I, I found enterprise architecture successful, to be successful, is not to call it that. Uh, and we found, we started to take a look at what is the easiest thing, you know, the, what I would say the uh, lower uh, hanging fruit, the low hanging fruit. And we found that was to standardize on IT, but even that was a tough job. Uh, because, because we were able to standardize on IT architecture and standards, now we are able to essentially have a, almost two or three only images for the entire NASA family or uh, supporting over 80,000 seats, which is phenomenal. And if you look at the cost savings we achieved just by doing that, essentially standardization, centralizing, and outsourcing, we're at NASA Glenn alone, uh, because we took the leadership role in the agency, we saved over $80 million in the last 10 years. I mean, that's cost avoidance. And uh, so over the course of time, the rest of the centers have also followed suit. So if you add up all the cost savings, that's phenomenal. And that's at the elementary level. The other thing that we did at NASA was to also start top down. Uh, when we talk about the business processes, uh, we wouldn't believe when we first got together, everybody was counting uh, full-time equivalents differently. One center said it was 1,700 hours. Somebody else said it was 2,080. There was absolutely no commonality, and there was no way to evaluate how each project is doing because everybody had a different number just for FTEs. So we went through several iterations, and Kelly is aware of that. Yes. Uh, you know, we worked together in a couple of things on that. But eventually what happened was we adopted the government version of SAP, and now we are doing that. Now we have a single book that we can actually technically close every single day. It used to take us like two, two months to close the books before, because we are always reinventing new terms and term definitions. So with the introduction of SAP at the top end, we're able to standardize and common business practice uh, policies, and we're able to enforce that across the entire agency. So now you know we are paying things on time, which center is not paying things on time, and all that is much more visible. There's a lot of resistance, as you can imagine, but we come a long way in that. Now we're focusing on how we can do the standards in the mission side of the house. So it's, it's the same battle all over again in a different domain. So I'll, I'll start a little bit from a slightly different angle. I mean, we, everybody talked about enterprise architecture, what it means. It's really, it really means different things to different people. It really means different things to different organizations. It, it tied to all, what all the speakers talked about, the objectives, what it is that you're trying to get from the, uh, from the business strategy, from the IT strategy, ma marrying it together. Uh, it's about agility. It's about, uh, it's about, in my opinion, the most important thing about, uh, thing about enterprise architecture is doing things right. So a lot, I'm, as you, you probably noticed from some of the questions I posed to Dr. Ross and, and, and talking to some of you, I'm a big proponent of governance. It, how, how do you get things done right is through governance. It's establishing the right ways to govern your enterprise architecture initiatives 
is governing your enterprise architecture directives and how do you essentially, so once you build that wonderful platform that Dr. Ross talked about, how do you drive people to use that platform? And that's, that's really the, the crux of the matter. How do you get up to that next level in your evolution is by using enterprise architecture and driving everybody to reuse of that, of that platform and then and actually establishing um, a recourse for not necessarily following the enterprise architecture. So what, what's the... Uh, what's the carrot on the stick? So I mean, there's there's a lot of research that's been done about carrot on the stick and and uh, uh, policy of of benefits of uh, and not benefits of of doing that or, or pitfalls of doing that. But I, I'm still a big believer of of that kind of kind of approach because it, it it puts pressure on people to do things right and then punishes them and then there's some punitive damages for for not necessarily doing things right. So I think that's the biggest opportunity and challenge in enterprise architecture is governance. Hi, I'm Scott McPherson. I've uh, been spending a lot of time at Progressive over the last several years in this space. Uh, like Jeannie said, um, I didn't wake up one day and say, boy, I want to be an enterprise architect guy. I was kind of in the role after uh, really focusing a lot of attention in IT on how do we deliver faster, higher quality, and manage costs more effectively. We did a lot of research on that, and a big thing that we did, we brought a lot of people in from the outside, but again, starting at the top. Um, we let, read, read a lot of books, one was Genie's, but a lot of it all talked about you have to get senior executive engagement or you're going to go nowhere with this. So we spent a lot of time. We do have, uh, I think, quite a bit of engagement from our CIO all the way down. Um, but that said, I think one of the big challenges is still every day, we did a lot of work up front. We had a big kickoff with probably 150 senior business people and IT people. We did a lot of brainstorming on where we wanted to go. We talked about all kinds of things from architecture to ITIL to standard development practices, what's really going to help us get going. Um, very, very helpful. But the big challenge we have is to continue. We slipped into that becoming IT's problem. Um, we started off that whole conference with it being how does progressive better leverage IT to kind of drive the business forward. We did a bad thing, I think, but I went with the flow. Uh, we called it IT 2.0. Big IT because that meant it was affecting all of progressive, but I think as we got into the implementation, it started being more of an IT issue, and we have to constantly work on kind of saying this is business involvement, business engagement. I think we made great progress on that. I love the, the graph as well that Jeannie has in the book, the same one you love, Ed, um, where it shows kind of starting off in that siloed world, moving into the, uh, the technology standardization space, then into the optimized core, because that is the path we're on. We're very heavily rooted in stage two, starting to work with our business folks. We've got a meeting next Friday to start branching off into stage three, um, but that's a challenge. The other thing, and I don't think it would be unique to other companies, but at Progressive, pace is a very important thing. We've always been a fast-moving company. Uh, don't know if that's what drove the name some 70 years ago, but certainly it's been a fast-moving thing, and continuing to remind people this is a journey. It's not next week we're going to be done with this. There's a couple things we check off the checklist. It's an evolution of changing the entire way we do business in IT and with our business partners to drive Progressive forward. Uh, just to point out that uh, Jeannie has to leave in order to catch her plate. So thank you very much. And, uh, uh, I'll just make a very uh, general, more academic comment on this. I think that one of the reasons why we are struggling with the term and with the sort of co uh, what, it, what does it mean and what does it cover is that uh, we don't really know it. We know only that there's something very new and different in the way in which we have to think about how we design businesses and organizations, which has come uh, actually as an outcome that the IT capability has reached a certain t critical tipping point, that you actually can only design organizations based on IT capabilities, not the other way around. And uh, that, ch uh, that changes the whole logic and the whole mindset of how you think about business and organizations. And uh, we, nobody, nobody has written and knows the definitive answer to this question. Because it's like being in an industrial uh, revolution in 1840 or 1830, when the modern industrial organization emerged. And nobody knows. And then, of course, over the last 100 years, we have established a fairly standardized way of thinking about organizing and managing, which we, in which we have learned to live, and which we have breathed. 
and now it's changing. That's the reason why management is confused, and that's the reason why it's very difficult to address that as a behavioral and managerial and cognitive change. The technology part is probably the easier one, the behavioral and the sort of cognitive part is much more difficult. And uh, that we are in the middle of that uh, big dip, I think. And that's, uh, that's the reason I, I think this is a really cool topic. Uh, and somebody will come later on probably and write a definitive book about it. Like uh, we know the management classics from the uh, 1930s and 50s, like Chandler's work and Barney's and so forth, which pretty much define what the current organizational form is and how, it, you, how you manage that. That's sort of my, my sort of big story in it. And I think that we shouldn't lose our sight in this. And it, it comes down to the digital capabilities and the transformative capability at the end. It's changing everything at the uh, nearly all layers of business. IBM sort of nearly died because of it, but it learned at the, at the sort of last moment that it, it had really changed and, uh, and it has been actually a harbinger of this type of new way of well, running business. And, and we've saved yes. billions of dollars in yes. the process, and billions of dollars in, in the organization to, as a result of, of enterprise architecture. I mean, it was a total transformation of the organization, and it stemmed it at yes. standardizing and, and looking at Certainly, the curve. We didn't know those curves existed when we yes. did it. We just knew that things had to change, and yes. uh, the amount of money that's been yes. saved annually in the transformation of the company is yes. uh, is phenomenal. Like uh, just a point of uh, one additional point, and then I'll try to sort of keep you to talking. Let me. If you look at the uh, uh, Gini Ross curve, it pretty much says that uh, you start uh, consolidating and standardizing your IT capabilities. Then you go to the core capabilities. That's pretty much the, like turning the table around in the other way around, saying that IT capability is the fundamental part of the organization. That's how you design the organization. You know, build those first. Then you start leveraging. That's the agility phase. And when you move over that, that's exactly what happens. So you have to turn the whole organizational logic the other way around. That's so, how it's so painful. It's painful because it hits every part of the organization. And you have to do when you're running or sailing. You have to build in your ship when you're sailing. That's pretty much the metaphor, what we can think about it. I think the chassis probably, uh, to some extent, admits that based on the experience you have had in NASA over the last 15 years. That it has been really uh, probably uh, minds changing and behavioral changing the change. Uh, let's uh, go sort of more uh, sort of uh, lower level things. That one thing which uh, we discussed is that how do we uh, justify and evaluate uh, these types of initiatives at different stages? I think that in different stages you have to provide different targets, set up different targets. Uh, are, are there any guidelines or what, what would you have learned that how do you, how to identify those tipping points and how you sort of move ahead in how you justify these things? I think the easiest are the cost savings, but then yeah. beyond that. No, I. I think, as Dr. Ross described, yes. you cannot skip a stage. The stage has to be done in series. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you don't have the, the benefit of business level sponsorship, getting from stage one to stage two is certainly still quite viable. As a matter of fact, it's not even really a prerequisite uh, to the advancement of, of virtualization and consolidation and standardization and, and those things. And I see that happening in a lot of places. But there are a number of firms that aren't even doing that. Um, but to go from stage two to stage three is absolutely uh, requires that, that responsibility of that time between business. Because the types of things that you're dealing with in, in there is optimizing the information in the process. And that is all about the business, in the, especially in the finance sector. I mean, I, I speak from a bias there because that's where my experience is. But because it is what's manufactured. Uh, in the absence of working with a business. And so where we see or where I see firms starting to explore and, and expose the inefficiency between the linkage is on things like master data management. Master data is something that's shared across business units. The value proposition of getting master data management is in its name. It's the master of the data. Uh, when you're looking at s customer centricity or 360 degree views of customers, um, that implies that customers have um, especially if you're in a multi-line type of insurance company or a bank uh, offers multiple products, is, is that you're starting to address that issue is that it be, you have to digitize that information and it has to be available in a standardized way because the economy and your ability to execute it is predicated on it. And so that is, is what a way that I see firms addressing the issue of not only identifying the fact that you have the lack of standardization in the organization, 
but identifying the lack of governance structure on how data is managed, how data is represented, how is data, the terms of, you know, what's an FTE, uh, to the um, inefficiencies that exist in the process of how you, inf how you capture the data and reuse that information. Uh, you know, I think Nationwide is a beautiful example of how they have progressed through these stages and are, are, have done master data management, I think, well, and has been on the back of the fact that they've gradually gone through each of the stages. And I've seen firms that, that look at master data management and realize that they have to slow that program down because they miss some steps beforehand. And so I think that is an area, if you're looking for ways to help uh, shine the spotlight on either the strengths of the organization or the weaknesses of it, embarking on an initiative like that can really help drive uh, greater visibility to either the strengths or the shortcomings of the organization. And where the shortcoming is an opportunity for improvement. I would agree, especially when you look at the financial sector, because you said that's what we're all about, is the data. And so trying to bring data together from multiple locations that all have their own different ways of getting there and treating of the data and the massaging that has to go on to make sure that you've got the right things in the right place, extremely expensive to kind of manage that environment. I think one of the things, you know, definitely following the steps there is important. But if, if you're using somebody else's cold spaghetti diagram to help the business understand the problem, create your own. Um, we did it at our place and we use that, that diagram all the time. It really helps the business kind of see what's under the covers. The car can look really nice on the outside, but when you look the, lift up the hood and you see what's under there and all the wires and things that are hanging all over the place, people start to get an appreciation for the amount of complexity it's going to take associate to the business in business terms. There are stories you can tell with the data. We struggle with that early on is how do you describe to the business in business terms the issues that this uh, complexity that we've, that we've built up over years is causing. And there's ways to do that. There's ways to do that in the incident and problem data that you gather. There's ways to do that in speed to market as we start tracking kind of how fast are we moving through our projects and looking at delivery cycles of the past versus delivery cycles now. We're doing, uh, we've got our controllers all working together, business and our IT controllers on, what are those core me metrics we can put together to even manage things like financial throughput for the ideas that we're delivering on the business side? Are, what kind of cost per IT dollar or benefit, p benefit per IT dollar are we getting? But to me, it's all about translating our IT gibberish into business terms so they can really relate to the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and that gets you, and some of it is going to be a leap of faith early on. We don't have a lot of things to, uh, you know, kind of say, but if you can show them a picture, who can argue with a picture like that is going to cause you pain uh, and churn as you try to move forward and advance and add new capabilities? Where do you add them to? And in that diagram, it just shows all the places we really have to monitor data and we have to put all the balancing routines in because the integrity of our data is absolutely critical. And we spend a lot of time keeping that integrity up to speed. So. You know, and I think one of, the, one, of the challenge, one of the benefits of doing that, and I, I think that's a great idea, is that you can expose to the business what they help create. They made decisions very conscientiously to build and have these applications in the absence of standards. And so there's a consequence to the decisions that were made in the years before. But also, what are the consequences to the decisions they're going to make now? Are you going to continue to perpetuate that, that spaghetti mess? Or, or are you going to really invest to make those changes? And I think that's often forgot. It's like, it's IT's fault it looks like that. No, the reality is you made a very conscientious decision to, for us to, to build, build, build it that way because either you wanted it quicker, you, you uh, felt like you were uh, completely different than others. And so I think it's important for them to see the consequence. Uh, NASA is composed of about nine field centers. And if you look at the history of the culture of the organization, each kind of grew up on its own independently. And now we have suddenly realized, okay, we need to work together. So because, because one, is, one is driving that is a cost and a timeliness to market. Because the longer it takes and the more people it takes to design the next design of the, uh, the design of the next generation of space vehicles, it's going to be far more expensive. We need as many people who can work on it as we have in terms of employees and contractors. So it became pretty obvious even on the engineering side of the house, they're creating uh, diagrams and data that were not interoperable. So it was impossible for uh, engineers at Glenn to, um, to collaborate with engineers at Johnson, Kennedy, and Marshall. So we are now in the throngs of trying, okay, now we have to define a standard by which all of us can agree to and be able to work on the same data so that we can actually design something faster and sooner. 
Now, well, the other thing that people need to realize it, and it's hard to convince the business side of it, when I say business side of the house and the mission side of the house, is it's all about the data. And I think once people realize the value of the data, then everything that is essentially either creating it or storing it or moving it, it becomes secondary. Because quite often we have these turf battles about actually standing up servers and applications and all that. If we can shift that argument to the data, which is at the end of the day, data is what makes you competitive. That is your competitive advantage. And if you can shift that argument to data, then it becomes painfully clear we got to have a mechanism to be able to easily translate it, move it, understand it, and be able to collaborate. And we found that to be a, an easier sell rather than draw, drawing lots of pictures about all, all kinds of things because data people understand. So to move the argument from um, IT systems to actually what it's all about, which is data. So I'll, I'll, I'll actually follow on, on the discussion of value of the EA, right? So, so one of the things that I'd like to share with you is my experience of selling EA to the organization, whether it's a new organization or existing organization. So it's really hard to sell EA on its own merits, right? Nobody re will really believe you. you. You can draw all the nice pictures in the world. You can show all the nice diagrams. You can show all the research. The executives are not gonna believe you unless you, you can back it up with solid results. So my, my advice to you guys is just don't try it without necessarily having to go one of two routes. So first, you either go down to the executive route and convince them that EA is good and they should do it without necessarily, uh, without necessarily having the results, right? Or the CIO or the, or the business executives, whoever is going to support you, that would be great. So the, one of the examples I can tell you in National City, when, when you all remember the ill-fated National City, right? Um, we had great success in implementing EA just because we had executive sponsorship. Our CIO, our CEO, and all of our business execs all supported EA. And we actually started the Enterprise Architecture Program without showing any results. Right, so and, and it was great. I mean, we were able to move very quickly. We were very mature, and actually, um, Ed, I think you mentioned something in terms of being. Some companies are able to mature in like ten years. We're able to mature in three years. So and and, and that was that was a great example of of what I call a perfect storm because we had the investment, we had the business, we had executive sponsorship, we had everything in place. It all came together very quickly. We're able to to mature very very quickly. So that's one way to go. I mean, if you have that support, great. Um, second way to go is start showing results. Everybody believes in results. Everybody knows that if you can show results, you can, you can probably scale. So, and, and that's what business executives, IT executives look for. They look for results. If you can show results, then you can start gaining funding, gaining momentum. So it's either top down or bottom up. There's a question. I'll start if you guys don't mind, and then I'm sure Scott will want to jump in. So the typical structure is architecture review board or any kind of architecture governance board that, that allows you to, to have that governance structure over the entire organization making certain architectural decisions. And it depends on the, on the size of the organization. You may have local governance boards, you may have global governance boards, and they make, may make certain decisions. Then then you're gonna have you're gonna have to have bodies that not only review standards but also make sure that you uh, obviously the the change control uh, board you, you're gonna have to have the implementation uh, governance configuration governance all of the, all of those elements you have to have in place that make sure that from up up down from design development and release standpoint you have you have all the points covered. So, and again, it, it really depends on your organization how you want to structure it. But the goal is to have the the global body that cover, drives down into more local bodies that can actually insert better control. Okay. Does anybody else want to address that? So question? we've uh, we've done a number of things with governance and tried not to set up so many governance teams that people felt like they were getting governed to death. 
But um, along with our transition we started a few years back, a big change was made in that we established a governance team with about eight of our senior business leaders and our CIO sits on it and they're reviewing all the project requests that are coming in. They have to come in with uh, you know, certain uh, packet of information, rough draft CBA, we do have stage gates we've set up through our SDLC, so there are other times where folks need to go back, and it's those business folks that are kind of managing that. Prior to that, we had a lot of siloed organizations. The claims business leader who I supported for seven years managed you know, within his budget. We did projects, didn't really care what other folks were doing. Uh, so there's a lot of talk back in those days about are we getting the right things done for Progressive? Because at any point in time, I could have been working on a project and claims that may have been much less value to the overall organization than something that was sitting idle in another place. So we got that team together. Our executive team has done a lot of work in terms of looking at the budget and how do we set investment levels, because there's a lot of talk about discretionary spend versus non-discretionary spend and how do you kind of keep those things in balance. So we actually have another team that governs the more non-discretionary side of the house, which is uh, I sit on that board with a few of my peers, our CFO, and two other um, business reps. So a little bit more technical side on that governance team, where the other one is much heavier weighted on business executives. And then um, one of the folks that manages my strategy and enterprise architecture, Mr. Thomas back there, um, manages our architecture review board. We do have a review board that we run projects through to make sure um, they're kind of aligning with our direction. If we see things that are kind of going astray, we have an opportunity to kind of coach people back into where they're going. So those are the probably the biggest ones we put in place at, at this juncture. And um, they're working pretty well. Because the way I, I know they're working well, especially with our uh, team with the business folks on it, they're starting to um, every year adding more meat to the objectives they have around what they deliver. And a big one they're, they're going to add to their agenda this year is kind of, we've got to look back at the end of our tenure and say, we've helped advance the overall architecture moving forward with the decisions we've made at this governance team. So I think pretty big steps in that direction. Yeah. The only thing that I would add is everything that you said, plus one more, because we do a lot of work through outside contracts. Mm -hmm. So we review the contracts to see what kind of IT they're uh, bringing in. Because quite often when you have a, when you're designing a space vehicle, it's very easy to say other incidental expenses is all about IT. And so one of the things we also put in the contract is to make sure we understand if that is needed, but how it's going to integrate with the infrastructure of NASA, that's one thing. Second, it goes back to the point I made earlier, how is the data that they're going to create, how is that going to be integrated so that we can integrate that into our knowledge base and be able to search it and use it later and so on and so forth. Because quite often if you don't have that as part of the governance program, then the data gets lost after every contract change. And all that money we invested is go, goes to waste. So there has to be some additional components along the line, uh, along with the, what you said. So. Thank you. The other thing I would recommend, um, I agree with what was described here, but it, Dr. Ross has written with Dr. Weil a book on IT governance, and the, the comment about getting it relevant to your organization, um, it won't prescribe for you what you should do. It'll, it allows you to understand the choices and the parameters around those choices about how you might govern, and then you can make the best decision for your organization. It, it's, I, it was one of the, they are, by the way, foremost experts on governance in the world that I've ever seen um, on the topic. So um, I have the ISBN number if you need it, to, if you want that book. Right. We'll start stage now from the four floors. We have gentlemen here. Cultural change is huge. Um, we invested a lot in bringing outside folks in to help us with organizational change management because a lot of what we're talking about is really getting the mindset to change from the way you did things today to the way you're going to do things tomorrow. 
So we spent a lot of time educating our executives, both on the IT side and the business side um, from that dimension. And then we, we actually created an organization in-house that was you know, tasked with kind of managing that and continue to use the consultants internally. We still have a long way to go. I mean, it is a slow, that, I think that's one of the reasons it's a journey. It's not just all the technical things and getting the design principles and getting all that other stuff. It is the constant going back and reminding folks showing them those wins that you get along the way because people need things to kind of hang on to and say, I, I do see this becoming a better place as we move forward. Because you will be impacting people's jobs on this, what they do every day, it's gonna change. They might not like the change or understand what that change is. So being able to get out there in front and help, communication strategy, communicate, communicate, communicate. No matter how good you think you're doing at it, I would say you still are no good at it and just keep working at it because it, it takes enormous effort to get out in front and communicate these types of changes. I, I totally agree with Scott that organizational change management, absolutely critical. The other is govern, don't police them. If you, if you police them, it, it's a de it's deterrent. They, they, wanna, they'll, uh, they won't excel and they'll look for ways to, to circumvent the process. So guide them, help them, give them the assistance they need in, in, uh, and then good things will happen. So I'll, I'll add also I mean, a excellent point, Scott and, and Ed, I, I can't agree more. Uh, the one thing uh, I think is, go is very important is showing success, uh, success. I talked about showing success. And once you're able to show success, heads will turn. And again, communication, showing the relevant success points. And then once you keep pounding that in, once you keep pounding that we did this and it succeeded and, and it resulted in this. So for example, we implemented enterprise architecture. We're able to consolidate the platforms and as a result, we saved so much, so many millions of dollars. We're able to, uh, to accelerate project delivery and so on. B business executives will catch on. And it, as you continue to communicate these types of successes, they will continue to understand. So uh, I'll come back again to the story, national city story. Um, we were able to start an enterprise architecture initiative as an IT initiative and then show the success to business and then business embraced it. They wanted enterprise architecture, right? They demanded it. The only other thing I would add is that instead of the IT standing up and saying, saying how valuable EA is, you should have some of the success story, the business executives from that organization stand up and say that because that adds a lot more value because otherwise we'll always be viewed as self-serving. Uh, we have here one there at the back. I'll just say, make a very short comment. If you listen what what you are t telling, it's that it's a traditional story of a fairly radical innovation coming to an organization. And how do you change the behaviors in the organization, the cognitive models, the behaviors, and the expectations? Because the, that technology and that uh, requires certain type of fairly fundamental change in many parts of the organization, pervasive change. That's what uh, it pre pretty much tells you. Of course, there's a fairly significant literature in general about how to manage all innovations and how to deal with very radical innovations. But it, the, the one part of that story is that it's difficult and it's painful. Mm -hmm. It's going to be that. But that, that's like, a, like the phoenix. You have to sort of go through that in order to rise again. Uh, I have also another very small thing. There are a lot of studies which show that IT people are the least likely to change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as a type of personality and uh, as a type of uh, so professional group. They are well, happy to change others, but uh, <laughs> not, not to change the, themselves. Uh, uh, it's uh, just a probably self-selection and certain other things in the uh, profession. So. Um, you heard earlier this morning from Dr. Ross, the, the, the echo was a little bit in your last comments. Um, that EA I'll tell you, I mean, NASA is it's within the IT organization. You know, I mean, we would be more than happy to give it up if it will survive on its own merit. <laughs> so we're still working on that. I, I don't think from, from a NASA perspective, depending upon the domain, like I was saying earlier, we're successful. But there are other domains we're still just breaking ground. Yeah, the same here at Nationwide. It's still an IT function. It's still growing function. In my experience, once you mature the EA function and it's truly mature and it's truly embraced, then it can leave IT organization and go to, go to the business, unless it started in the business. And then somebody, I, I think uh, 
one of the speakers had that examples where it, it, it started in the, in the business organization and then went back to IT. And I, the IBM story is one, and maybe we're a little bit different because we are an IT organization, but we manufacture products from a manufacturer, we, we sell them, we have professional services. It was actually extracted out of IT. It was a separate business entity in of itself, and it was around operational optimization. And so, and then it, then it actually went in, actually IT was consumed underneath it. So the, the CIO's office actually was consumed underneath it. It's, it was a little bit different pattern, but again, maybe we're a, um, kind of a one-off case given the nature yeah. of our business. All right. Yeah, we're uh, reporting to IT now to the CIO. I think uh, you know, pretty tight relationship with the CIO, the CEO, and the executive team on that. We actually talked about before we formed the organization and moved on, should it report to the CIO, the CFO, the CEO? I think there's openness to where it is, but I do think we've got some work to do before we talk about migration. I know that you want to get home and other things. I'm just checking out how much you are sort of willing to continue this discussion. I'll probably take a couple of others, but I don't want to embarrass other side, the, the panel, that they're talking to the empty, empty space that everybody leaves. But I'll, I'll take first uh, uh, back from the, uh, George. Before I, you ask, just a comment. I know uh, there are several large organizations which have put IT and process together, and they don't even call anymore something at IT department. They call it just process management or process integration or process optimization. And they typically are directly under the CEO. So it's regarded that. I know that Intel is the, has reorganized in that way, Nokia reorganized in that way, and so on. So it, it, there are some examples of that happening. Yes. There was one more in the, oh yes, please. question, and it comes down to the politics of the business schools, and I don't know whether there's anybody listening here what I'm saying now, but anyway. <laughs> For some reason, there is an expectation by MBAs that, uh, typically, that um, IT is technology, and, ma and managers don't have to care about technology. That's the general expectation. And, you know, you know, and I think it's totally wrong, especially given the thing which I said before. Uh, especially when you look at the future. I think that you can only manage uh, any type of organization in the future if you understand certain aspects of the technology because the technology of the de is the design of the organization. It reflects it. And that's through which you design the organization. And if you don't understand that, it's very difficult to manage that. You can, of course, learn everything about leadership and uh, even financial things. Uh, but you don't really understand how to design organizations which can deliver value. <laughs> And that's the thing, we, we try to do that in our core MBA classes, so we, we have a lot of focus on enter enterprise architectures, uh, uh, architecting, uh, options, things like that, so they can also relate to sort of option pricing, how to finance your classes and so forth. But still, uh, you don't know whether it's like a war and the keys back that uh, it's, uh, they just forget when they go beyond the class. The, the response is very interesting. Either students love it or they hate it. But there are very little in between. 
And I think in mo most other classes, it's more probably more di normally distributed. I don't know why it is. It's maybe just because they don't like the technology. So those who can o overcome that thing and say that, yes, there's interesting stuff here, they like it. But those who never sort of reject it, they don't, uh, they don't do it. But I think it is a, in general, it's a challenge. Yes, the other part of that is that they think that everything is small and nice and cool and easy. Uh, it's uh, just you learn what you call the six pack, you know, the, the PowerPoints and Excel. And that's IT. That's easy. That's what you need as a manager. But uh, instead of you say that you have to actually manage and be responsible for large systems, which are totally critical for your business. And, if, and you have to architect them. You have to understand how they deliver value. And that, of course, when they don't have, it's very difficult to visualize a, a system, a large system, and how uh, how to deliver that. If you haven't ever, if you are only seeing the user interface, you don't understand how much there is complexity behind it. And that's probably the challenge with preparing. Of course, people who have engineer have engineering background, how to take take it easy. But uh, the rest, if you want to go just marketing and making presence, it's much more difficult. Or finance, where they just think that money is the only thing which matters in organization. I know also that what is interesting, which you pointed out, is that surprisingly many finance organizations are fairly poorly managed in terms of IT, even though they invest a lot in IT. And that's probably because there, there is this type of sense that it doesn't, it's not a part of the management challenge. Yeah, certainly the, the digital natives yes. versus the digital, yes. digital yes. immigrants. Uh, we see a, a, a senior management in most organizations today are immigrants to the, to the digital world. And I think the case that you describe is, is very valid, that, that it's a necessary evil in order to operate the organization. Uh, when you get those that are digital natives, leading organizations, uh, you see it as a competitive advantage, and you have a higher expectations for it. Um, and it would be interesting to see, you'd have to look at this historically, but even in yes. your own program, to see what the appetite is for those, and what the expectation level is for someone walking into an MBA program today uh, and their desire or their ability to adapt to the, uh, and accommodate technology versus those uh, just a decade ago. I think it would be radically different. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Are there any other questions? One more. That's probably the last for the road. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting issue. Um, first, you have to accept the fact that there are multiple disciplines, or professions in an organization, and there needs to be, a, a, I believe, there ought to be some clarity provided on what their roles and expectations are. So in the absence of that, doing enterprise architecture with the view of about roles and responsibility becomes even more challenging. If we make the assumption that those things exist, maybe in their, in their uh, native form, uh, when it gets applied to the notion of enterprise architecture, then I think where you end up with this overlap um, is just a, more or less a responsibility of where you're going to draw the boundaries. And, and I think that becomes just expectation management you know, as it relates to EA versus architecture um, in very specific isolation. Although when we think about enterprise architecture, we are adding additional disciplines. Uh, we, we encourage a higher um, additional uh, roles like uh, business architects, architects dealing with business process, information architects, those dealing with information, um, certainly project managers. Uh, and so getting and blurring the distinction between those boundaries can be a challenge. I think it's a little bit more of an art than a science, but I think uh, in this case, it's about just establishing a practice and then sticking to it. And, and, and well, sticking to it to the, to the extent that it makes sense, but being flexible enough to accommodate changes as, as skills change, uh, and then investing in the professions. This is where we see a lot of activity in the sector, a lot of professional development activity. And so as they grow, you can expand the uh, scope as their experience base increases as well. So, I agree there is an overlap, and I think having the overlap is a good thing, you know, because that actually gives you opportunity for the conversations that you need to have. Uh, at NASA, most of the stuff is done through project management, and we have strict guidelines. But the guidelines are flexible enough 
they can make, ask for variances to that, but it gets decided by an executive committee, especially if it has to do with human flight. So there's a lot of different gates that the project has to go through, and if one of them is procurement review that has to do that, if it has to have a safety exception, it has to do that. If it has to have an EA review, it'll have to do that. So there are many gates by which it go goes before it's finalized. It is rigid to some extent if you want to look at it that way, but the project manager has the option to say, we want to waive this particular requirement, and that's also um, debated and then settled. So one thing I, I would like to say is that there's different levels of architects, right? So the enterprise architects in the purest sense are the ones that are essentially governing the execution of enterprise architecture strategy. And those architects don't necessarily participate in projects, right? They, they either, they could, right? Or they simply um, set the governance standards, sit on architecture review boards, they create strategies and so on. So there's different levels. I mean, so you have to, you have to really set those up prior to really uh, embarking any, on any projects. As, as these guys have mentioned, I mean, you have to have a solid software development methodology in place to really be able to execute on it. And then you, you have to know which architect has to perform different roles. For example, at Nationwide, we have very well-defined roles such as project architects. Those are architects that simply work on projects and deliver, deliver project deliverables. And then we have system architects that, that essentially manage systems, right? They know what systems are. The, that particular role never, never participates in projects, but they own architecture related to particular systems, right? And the, there's other roles I won't get into them, but that's just examples of how those roles differentiate. So there's, there's the intersection between the governance, right? The enterprise architecture governance that's related to enterprise architecture strategy and the architecture, application architecture that, that's that's related to conformance to that strategy. And they, they intersect, intersect in the middle, and you have to understand which roles are responsible for which. We spent, I think, everybody's enterprise architecture organization may look a little bit different. We've got some things in ours that may not be in yours. But one of the things we did was put the methodologies team inside my organization. And a big part of that is kind of describing that system development life cycle where the PMO plays into that, where does enterprise architecture play in that, where's the role of app dev, we've got a nice framework that kind of describes a lot of things. Some cases, app, we own the framework, application development obviously has a lot more say so in what goes into the SDM and in EPMO, so we've kind of really structured that I think pretty well, we've got a very good diagram and framework that we put together for how these organizations work together. We spent a lot of time on role clarity tons of time on role clarity. It's a place that we used our communications team, some of the outside help to put these things in, not exhaustive books that you gotta read, what's my job, job aids that are one page make it pretty straightforward into where we drew those boundaries. But that's not gonna resolve all issues. In the end, you still have to apply judgment to how you do things, but we've at least kind of centralized the team to kind of manage those uh, debates and disputes we need to have and get those resolved. But it's, I think it's worked out very well and uh, give a lot of credit to my team that kind of manages that group. Thank you very much. I think that uh, it's time probably to close up this uh, uh, one nice afternoon on enterprise architectures, and I thank you all of you, the, the panelists, the speakers, and also the, all the rest for the active participation. There has been some discussion with Benko that we will probably do this uh, next year again, uh, because it looks that uh, there is a need for this type of uh, forum to discuss and debate and uh, also learn about from, from one another and bring the, the best knowledge from the, uh, from the field uh, to bear upon the local discussion on these topics. And we are happy to pro provide this uh, role and arena for doing it in case if you are interested in doing that. I also understand that probably there is uh, uh, the website where the, there's information that if there's some feedback you want to uh, send us, with regard to the arrangements and uh, program and what you would like to do, we would be very happy to entertain that. I can also take your business card or just uh, put it somewhere there so you can send it to me. But uh, that's probably the last thing which I want to say. So just enjoy the weekend. It's going to be uh, snow again, but be happy in, sp in spite of that. Yes. <laughs>